Good morning. Welcome to Union Presbyterian Church as we gather to worship our God. And special thanks to Kathy Charrington, our, our guest musician again this morning. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And it's good to see everybody here on this second Sunday of Easter. It is not over, right? Last Sunday was not all that there was of Easter. Last Sunday is Resurrection of the Lord Sunday, the first Sunday of Easter, because there are how many days of Easter? 50. 50 days. And why is 50 important? It's how long Jesus stayed on the earth before his ascension. Yes. And why 50? What's big about 50? It's more than Lent. Is that what you were going to say? Is that what you were going to say too? More than Lent. That's right. Lent is 40 days, right? Um, and so it is more because we remember that that means that the light always outshines the darkness, right? Uh, Easter is always longer than Lent to help us remember that, uh, that the darkness shall never overcome the light. And so we gather here on this day of light, of increasing light, uh, on a day before interesting things are going to happen with lights in the sky. And we gather together uh, to worship the God of it all. And so we are able to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad in it. And let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Would you join me in our opening responsive prayer that's in the bulletin? Emptier of tombs, you raised Jesus from the grave so all fears might be banished, so the locked doors of our hearts could be flung open, so our quivering lips could declare what we have seen and heard. Bright glory of God, as you stood in the middle of your friends on that first Easter night, come now among us. In this time and place, showing us that death and sin no longer stand in the way of our life with you. Breath of peace, strengthen us so we may stand with all who fear life. Take our hands in yours so we may serve all who are broken with grief. Inspire us to share the grace which has been breathed into our very souls. God in community. Holy in one, hear us as we bring you peace and worship today. Amen. Do you know how valuable you are to God? What makes you feel that? What makes you doubt it? Do you know how valuable all others in the world are to God? When is it easy for you to see someone as lovable? When is it hard for you to see someone as lovable? Talk with God about these things in a time of silence now. Friends, hear the good news from the way, from the cross, from the empty tomb. And to this day, Jesus calls us beloved again and again. Help us to feel ourselves as lovable as you see us, Lord. Help us to love others as openly as you do. Thanks be to our God of unending, unlimited love. Amen. I'd like to invite our children, our youth, and anybody feeling especially like a child of God today to come on up and join us on the steps. How are you guys today? 
Good, good. Any of you guys ever hear of or watch the show The Price is Right? No? All right. Well, you, you have. What, what's, do you know what the show is about? Um, you try to guess the price of certain items, and whoever is the closest without going over wins. Awesome. You try to guess the price of the items, and whoever is closest without going over wins. All right. I'm going to show you some items, and I want to see if you can guess uh, how much they are. All right. No, you don't get to keep them. Sorry. <laughs> we have here a beautiful white candle embedded with spring flowers, lit only a few times. What? Four seventy-five. Thirty-two uh, dollars or cents? Dollars. Twenty-five dollars. Five dollars. Eighty-five dollars. Uh, Twelve dollars. What? Three dollars. All right. Actual retail price. Sixteen ninety-nine. Who is close? Six without going over. Sixteen nine. Sixteen. All right. Twelve. All right. I think twelve might might have it. Uh, you get bragging rights, but I keep the candle. All right. We have here a bag of sand. It's a bag of sand. Five fifty. Five bucks. Seven. Ten. Seven fifty. Eleven, four. Actual retail price? Two ninety nine. Two ninety nine. It's just sand. Two ninety nine. All right. We have here a handmade ceramic bowl. What do you think? One hundred thirty five dollars. Eighty five dollars. Seventy dollars. Fifty seven dollars. $63, $150. I have no idea, but somebody here does because she made it. So what's the actual retail price of this handmade bowl thrown by my sister-in-law sitting next to my brother who are in visiting? $36, $36. I know, I know. She is so good, isn't she? I tell her these things, $36. But you know what? She says $36, I say it's priceless. Why might I think it's priceless? Because it's handmade. It is handmade. By your daughter-in-law. By my si sister-in-law, sister-in-law, yes. By my aunt. By your aunt, it is handmade, right? Somebody I love made this. Right? And so it kind of makes it priceless. Not only that, but we use this almost every time. Where have you seen this before? Communion. We use this almost every time we serve communion. This is what is, serves as our chalice. This is what holds our juice. Right? It's on the table, and it's what we lift up. Some of you have lifted this up for us as we've done the blessing. So not only was it made by somebody that I love, but it was used by people I love. You guys. You guys and we have celebrated it together, right? And so this cup is kind of all kinds of priceless for lots of reasons. So the clay might be worth a certain amount, it might sell for a certain amount, but to me it's priceless. So here's my question, what are you worth? Two bucks. Oh, Sawyer, my, 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 my wonderful friend, we need to talk, my, my friend, because you're worth a lot more than that. 20 million, including your organs. All right, we're, 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 we're getting some harvesting stuff. All right. Again, priceless. Again, priceless. You know what? I'm going to agree with the little one on the end. Priceless. Priceless. Why? Yeah. It's you. Because it's you. Because I am me. Because you are you. Same thing. Because she's her and you're you. Yes. You were made by somebody who loves you, right? God crafted your spirits. God loves you, and so you are priceless. People love you. You can love yourself. You are priceless, right? And whatever amount somebody might put on our organs, right? We as an individual, every single one of us is priceless to God. And that's what I want you to carry with you today that no matter how sometimes we might feel about ourselves or others might try to make us feel, 
that because God loves you, you are priceless no matter what we feel at that moment. And when it's hard to remember our own worth, we can remember that. I am a child of God, and so I am priceless. If somebody tried to buy us, we can't be bought because we're priceless. We have no price. Does this mean that God is like 70 billion, 7 billion times us? I, I, think, I think we are made in the image of God, so God is priceless too. And so I have for you today, uh, I, I, I have some price tags for you. And they do not say $2. They do not say $20 million. They say priceless here, grab that one. And so you can take that with you and remember your worth. And there are a few more in here, so if there's anybody out there forgetting that today, I'm going to leave it up here and just feel free to grab one uh, as spirit moves you, okay? If I pray, would you guys pray after me and you guys too? Dear God, Dear God. You are so precious to us. You are so precious to us. And you love us right back. You love us right back. Thank you for making us priceless. Thank you for making us priceless. Help us treat ourselves that way. Help us treat ourselves that way. And treat each other that way too. Treat each other that way too. In Christ's name we pray. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys. And you guys can all either go back with your families or out with Mrs. Bates to Sunday school this morning. And as they do, I want to invite the rest of us to rise in body or spirit as we're able, and we will sing number 108 in the hardcover hymnal in front of us, Christ is Alive. Let's rise and sing. First reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John. It is the story of Thomas and the first of the resurrection appearance stories. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Our second reading this morning. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have a fellowship with him, while we are walking in darkness, we lie, and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Holy Scripture of God. Thanks be to God. It's about trust, I think. Jesus, after he uh, was risen, began to do some of these resurrection appearances. He showed up to all of his disciples in this locked room, all of them except Thomas. And then later Thomas shows up and all of the apostles said, guess what just happened? And they tell him and he says, I don't believe you. I don't believe it. I don't trust that what you are telling me is what actually happened. That what you're telling me is true. I don't trust it. We don't know why Thomas didn't trust what they had to say, but he says he didn't. I mean, it's a big ask, right? It's a kind of a weird thing. Right? That's uh, almost strains believability for anybody. We don't know exactly why he didn't trust, but something about him said, I don't trust that what you're saying is the truth of what really happened. Barbara Krasner and Austin Joyce write about the idea that all trust is rooted in the truth. That is, that when we are able to be truthful with each other and we show that we are being truthful and authentic, trust gets built. When we're not truthful with each other or authentic with each other, trust begins to break down. Truth is the catalyst for trust. Now, Paul, in our second reading this morning, he uses sin language around it. Right? He talks about the idea, he says, um, repeating what Jesus said, we are all sinners. 
Right? We all commit sins, and if we, if we think that we don't, we're lying. And worse yet, because Jesus has said that everybody sins, we're calling Jesus a liar. Everybody sins, it happens. But what's sin? Well, the sort of traditional understanding of sin is that it has to do with obedience. That if I am obedient to God's rule, to God's law, to God's ways, then I'm doing okay. If I break those rules, if I break the law, then I'm sinning. The problem is that that's not how Jesus talks about sin anywhere in Scripture. Jesus doesn't associate sinfulness with obedience. He talks about it from a love perspective, a relational perspective. In fact, a huge portion of his ministry was spent trying to, to teach us that we got too legalistic over our understanding of all this stuff. That people accused him uh, frequently of having broken the law because they misunderstood what obedience looked like. And so the idea that sin is about obedience seems pretty foreign to what Jesus is teaching us. When I think of sin, what actually draws me is something that some of the early desert mothers and fathers talked about in their understanding of it. Now, around 500 AD, give or take, there was a group of men and women that uh, felt like they were having a hard time hearing God through the noise of the world. That everybody was sharing thoughts about all kinds of stuff and they couldn't hear God anymore because they were just hearing what everybody else was saying they should think. They were having trouble hearing God directly because the church was talking too loud. And they had a hard time discerning what God was really saying from what the church was teaching. And so they actually moved outside into the desert areas around the Holy Lands. In particular, they went to Egypt. And they settled there to try to get away from the noise so that they could be quiet and just listen to God. Those became the earliest monks and nuns. They became those that got known as the desert mothers and fathers. And their, their teachings that they sort of got from, from being in that place of trying to experience God directly became known as the desert tradition, or the way of the desert. In her book about the sayings of those folks, Christine Voltner Paintner says this, According to the desert tradition, we have forgotten our true worth and the source of that worth. We have fallen asleep to the true nature of life. We have numbed ourselves to the struggles of living. In the desert tradition, sin might be described as this act of forgetting the treasures we each carry simply by virtue of our divine inheritance. In the desert tradition, then, sin is not about this idea that we have been disobedient. Sin is about the idea that we have forgotten how valuable we are and how valuable everybody is. And that when we forget those things, we begin to treat each other in ways that are not uh, holy, in ways that are not healthy. And that that is the sin because it begins to divide us. Now, in our culture, I don't think very often when we think about talking in, in terms of dismissing people's values, we, we usually go out and say, oh, they're worthless, that person's worthless, I'm worthless. I don't think that we tend to talk about it that way, probably at least partly because we're enculturated that that's not an okay thing to do to each other uh, or to ourselves. But we find ways, at least I know I do, to say it anyway. When I'm talking with somebody and they have a different opinion than I do about something, and I dismiss it, I minimize it. Maybe it's an opinion I disagree with, maybe it's an opinion that is hurtful, maybe it's an opinion that is scary, um, maybe it's, it's, it's an opinion uh, that, that I just am defensive against, right? And I dismiss the person because I just don't like that idea, I don't like that opinion. I have devalued that person. Not just what they say, it's not about agreeing with people, we can disagree with people fully, and still value them as a person in the conversation. But when we simply dismiss the person entirely because we don't like what they have to say or their ideas or, or they, they somehow come at us uh, in ways that are scary for us, uh, the ideas, when we dismiss them entirely, we have now devalued that person. I know I have done that. Oh well, look, here comes so-and-so. They're gonna, they're gonna share their thoughts again. Bye, right? Don't really wanna hear them, goodbye. Right? We devalue that person. When we neglect people, 
when we know that there is somebody who is hurting or in need or struggling with injustice and we just completely decide not to do anything about it, we show what worth they are to us and we devalue them. When there are whole groups that we look at and we say, because you're part of this group, I've decided that you're like this. I'm not going to get to know you as an individual. I'm not going to treat you as an individual. You're part of that group. You are, boom, right? We have now de devalued all of the individuals that come together to comprise that group. So we don't necessarily just go out and say they're worthless, but we find ways to do it, at least I know I do, more often than I would like, that show that I don't value another person fully. And what the desert tradition suggests is that's sinful. It's not just a not good thing to do or ni not nice thing to do, it breaks relationship. It's not just other people we can do this with either. Sometimes it's ourselves. Maybe you get to that place where uh, your, your sense is that I'm not really worth this. I have a thought. I have something I would like to share. I've got a voice to use, but I'm afraid that if I do it, people will be upset, somebody will be annoyed, and, um, and I'm not worth hearing as much as they are worth not upsetting. So I won't say anything. And we begin to devalue ourselves and our own voices simply because we think that their worth is more than ours, even if we're not wording it that way. Or sometimes we create self-fulfilling prophecies. I could never do that thing, right? I can't make that thing happen. And we're not talking about, you know, things, I'm never going to be an NBA player, right? That's, that's, not, that's not sinful to say, I can't play basketball, right? But to say, and therefore I am worth less than those who can, not true. Now, that's a kind of ridiculous example, but what if we bring it down to some real life stuff? I could never do that thing. I don't think that I'm good enough for that. And we begin to talk ourselves out of things that really maybe we could do. Maybe it would be something that we, we really could be helpful with or produce something or, or give back. We talk ourselves out of it, this self-fulfilling prophecy. And then we find stuff to point to for ourselves and others, right? That's, that's something that, that a future uh, nun will talk about closer to our day and time, Paula Houston. She says this, she says, sin is complicated because it is rooted in lying. In order to convince ourselves to enter into sin, we must in some way deceive ourselves, rationalize away our doubts, tell ourselves a consoling story about our real motivations. Each lie necessitates another, and we wind up morally and spiritually blind. I decide I can't do the thing, so I, I, I say I'm not good enough, uh, right? I'm not gonna share my thoughts on that because I don't want to upset the other person, I'm not good enough. Um, maybe, maybe I try. I begin to say it and I get cut off. Or I begin to say it and they go, yeah, 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 right? Look, they didn't listen, I'm not worth listening to, right? There you go, just proved it. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Not true, but we begin to lie to ourselves more and more to convince ourselves that our initial thought was true. Look at that person, right? They're so wrong, I'm not gonna listen to them again. Oh yeah, here, here, uh, uh, I can justify why to dismiss them, right? I don't need to listen to them because of this. I don't need to value them or understand that their perspective is valuable to them because of this. I can just dismiss that and here's my rationale for why. And I can begin to moralize why it's okay to devalue them. We tell ourselves more and more lies until we get to that place. I think the reason that the desert mothers and fathers considered it not just a not great thing to do, but actually sinful, is because it begins to actually divide us when we forget to approach one another in value. Because a piece of it has to do with it eventually bleeding into our capacity for authenticity. If I can't be myself with you because I'm hiding pieces so that I don't upset you or um, uh, you know, I don't say the wrong thing or whatever and devaluing myself, our relationship is kind of based on a me that isn't really there. It's partly me, but it's not really fully me. And so the relationship suffers. We'll always be at a little bit greater distance because I'm not showing you who I really am. If I don't let you be who you really are, right, if I don't value you enough to allow you to call that out of yourself, even when it's hard for me, then 
I don't really know who you are. I know part of who you are, but not all of who you are. I think that's the place where they saw it getting into a sinful nature. Not because it was disobedient, but because it keeps people further apart when we don't value one another. So we can wonder why Thomas didn't trust those people in that room. And we'll never know. We don't know exactly. Maybe they had in the past played tricks on him, played pranks on him, right? They, they said, we're going to do this. Ha ha, Tom, just kidding, right? He says, well, now I can't trust you to be telling the truth this time. Maybe it's kinder than that. Maybe it's that they knew how much he missed Jesus, and when he's missed things in the past or been having a hard time in the past, they went to him and kind of overinflated the stuff, right? It'll be okay. It'll be okay. Look, we saw him. We saw him. Let's just all tell Tom we saw him. We saw him. He's okay. It's real. Well, they've done that kind of thing in the past. Maybe they're doing it again this time. Maybe it was about his own worth. Maybe it was sort of a defensiveness, right? Man, if Jesus came back and I wasn't there, maybe I'm not worth coming back for. They are, but I'm not. And I can't hear that. I can't take that. So it didn't really happen. Right? We don't know the reason. What we know is that eventually Jesus did come back to him too. We don't know the reason he didn't trust them to begin with. But with that rootedness of trust being in truth, part of our work, and I'll give this to us as our challenge for this coming week, part of that work that we can do comes to that place of being aware that if I'm not trusting somebody, or if I'm not trusting myself, or if somehow I, I realize that in the midst of something in life, trust is just not there, is to ask the question, so who am I not valuing right now? Something isn't getting value. Either I'm not valuing myself, or I'm not valuing them, or we have a history of devaluing one another. Something happened to our ability to fully value one another that now I can't trust this. And while we might want to work on that thing in the moment, right? We want to get that thing done. Maybe they wanted to, to determine, so did we or did we not see Jesus, right? They're, they're trying to do an actual, an actual accomplishing something. Sometimes we have to reel it back and say, listen, it doesn't matter if we accomplish that thing. We need to start at the place of saying, how come we don't trust each other here? Where did the value go? The value of you, the value of me, and how do we both get that back and hold it with each other? How do we come back into that greater sense of unity? Thanks be that we have a God who didn't just come back then. He didn't just come back on Easter. He came back to that room. He didn't just come back to that room. He came back to the one who wasn't in that room and began to perhaps doubt himself and whether or not he was worthy to come back to. Thanks be that he will come back again and again in the coming weeks through appearances to the disciples. And thanks be that he comes back to each and every one of us every day again and again when we begin to forget our value, when we begin to forget the value of others, to remind us you are priceless because you are so, so loved. And so are all of God's other children in the world. Thanks be to the God who loves us and made us and calls us their own. Amen. In that spirit, I invite us to rise in body or spirit as we're able, and together we'll sing hymn number 358, again in that hardcover <coughs> hymnal, Help Us Accept Each Other. Let's rise together and sing.
Would you join me for the responsive prayers of the people that is in the bulletin? God of resurrection, you are the resilient one we follow. We follow you because you are good, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. You prove to us time and time again that your love never lets go of us. Jesus is on the loose, which means your love is on the loose. May your love give us resilience in the pain we endure. May your love and comfort give us resilience in these divided times. It is so easy for us to contribute to chants of division and hate, but your love is on the loose. So grant us the wisdom and courage to act with love and love. God of resurrection, in our despair, you offer us hope. We pray for those who feel overwhelmed by life's burdens, for those battling illness, for those facing financial hardship, and for those struggling with mental health. May your resurrecting power bring light into their darkness, comfort into their pain, and hope into their despair. In moments of loneliness, loneliness, we turn to you, knowing that you are always near. We lift up those who feel isolated and forgotten, those who long for companionship and connection. May your resurrecting presence bring forth communities of support and friendships that nurture and sustain. Amidst the grip of poverty and hunger, we cry out for justice. We remember those who lack the basic necessities of life, those who are marginalized and oppressed. May your resurrecting justice break the chains of inequality and empower us to work toward a world where all are fed and well. In the face of hatred and war, we seek reconciliation and healing. We grieve for the wounds caused by hatred and war. May your resurrecting love shatter the barriers that divide us and inspire us to actively pursue justice and equality for all. We give thanks for the places where we have witnessed resurrection. In the beauty of springtime, we see the promise of new life and growth. In the embrace of family, we experience the love that binds us together. In the waters of baptism, we are reminded of your grace that washes over us and transforms us. And in the acts of love shown through our community, we catch glimpses of your kingdom here on earth. So, God of resurrection, may your love continue to be on the loose. May your loving spirit continue to breathe new life into the broken places of our world and into our own hearts. May we be agents of your resurrection power, bringing hope, healing, and reconciliation wherever we go. Wherever your love is, we will try to follow. And let your love travel to those we now name in voice or in the silence of our hearts. We pray for Heidi and for Larry, for Tina, George, and Bev, for Dee, Sharon, Sewell, Linda, and Rhoda, for Susan, Mark, and Jackie, for Cody, for Helen and Walt, 
for Judy, for Sean, Mansi, and Naomi, for Martha, for Ray, and for Deb. Are there other prayers for need or for celebration that you're lifting up today and I can come to you? Any birthdays that we are celebrating this week or that we missed in the last couple weeks? Any anniversaries? Okay. Sometimes quiet weeks are good weeks. And so we pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory forever. Amen. And I will invite us to rise in body or spirit as we are able, uh, remembering that we are all children of God, going to children of God. Let's rise together and sing the hymn in our bulletin, Go My Children with My Blessing. So, my fellow priceless ones, we go from this place into a world where we will encounter other priceless children of God. Know that we go with the one in whose image we were made, God, the Christ, Holy Spirit. And because they are with us always reminding us of how beloved we are, we may go in peace.
The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all, now and always. Amen. I invite us to be seated for our post -lead. announcements for this morning. Uh, we uh, have coffee hour. We always have coffee hour because we always have coffee. Um, I believe I heard that there's also snacks. Snacks, thank you, Katie, for, for providing those. Katie, Katie has brought them for us today, so thank you. So we've got some snacks. We've got, um, we've got coffee, hot cocoa, teas, all kinds of stuff. So come and enjoy some fellowship time together. There is youth group after worship today from noon till 1.30 in the basement. Um, and so uh, hopefully the kids can stay for that. Uh, a couple of announcements for next Sunday. Uh, one of them is that uh, worship is going to be a little bit different next Sunday. Maybe you saw this in the Kirk Reader newsletter article that came out. One of the things is we have talked about uh, through our uh, uh, book study sort of thing that we have been doing, or it's not a study, but as we've been working through the, the ideas of the book, that we've talked about is flexibility of worship and what it means to worship in different ways. So periodically, and beginning next uh, Sunday, we're going to be worshiping in Fellowship Hall. Just every once in a while, not all the time. But we're going to do something called interactive worship, which is a style of worship in which we uh, don't just talk about stuff, and you don't just sit there and listen to me for way too long, but we actually get to interact with each other around our faith. 
So we'll be in Fellowship Hall for worship next Sunday. Uh, and also, uh, after worship next Sunday is our next time that we're getting together for a congregational gathering to talk more about uh, the Beyond Resistance that we've been talking about for a few months now. We'll do that three more times. Um, they were in the Kirk Reader again those dates, uh, once here in April, once in May, once in June. Uh, and so we hope that you'll be able to stay for us with that as we take a look at what God might be doing uh, with UPC in the future and, and calling us to shape uh, our life together. So next Sunday, Worship and Fellowship Hall, interactive. Uh, afterwards, some time to, to talk a little bit more as a congregation. So any announcements I missed? Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, our beautiful Easter flowers, our beautiful Easter breakfast. Thank you for, for, uh, for Jackie and Linda and all of those who did the work to, to pull all of that together. It was much appreciated. Um, it was a good time. Anything else? Anything you, you want to say about the sale? No, I just want to say we're still looking for your wonderful treasures for the sale. You know, big things, giving you call, you can arrange for pickup. Um, also, Evie's not here today, so I will say that. Okay, thank you. Eclipse classes, see Linda. Uh, uh, church World Service donations uh, can either come to the church or to Linda or to Edie. Uh, and, um, and the items that you will see out there, we didn't forget to clean up. Uh, they are rummage sale items and we can use more. We will be having a win. What's the date of the sale again? 20, 27th, thank you, last Saturday of April. So thank you. So yes, uh, bring those in and, and uh, that, will, that will help us out. And if you have time to spare, she can use some help that day putting this stuff together. Okay, all right. Let us go in the love and peace of Christ to serve the Lord. Amen.